you come all the way from the other side of town to share with you tonight. And there are some Lily Grove people in here tonight other than our magnificent choir and uh, our ultimate ushers who are here tonight. There are some other members of Lily Grove who are here. Would you raise your hand so I can see who you are? Amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you for your presence. I want these people at the church at Without Walls to know that if you don't start nothing, it, it, it won't be nothing. Uh, everybody not saved at Lily Grove. So you all better try to hush your mouth. There's a word I want to lift in your hearing found in Philippians at chapter number one. In verse number six, Philippians chapter one, in verse six, do I look pretty on this thing over here? I just want to, I want to know if my hair laying down. From the modern English translation, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Thank you. You may have your seats. The grass withers and the flower fades with the word of our God shall stand forever. I want to thank my television members for watching at six o'clock in the morning. You don't have time to watch your service. You, you, have to watch, you have to watch me preach and then get ready to go to church here at the Church Without Walls so you miss your pastor's preaching at, at 6.30. So thank you for tuning in to the real preaching on Sunday morning. I really, I really want you to know I appreciate that. I want to call this sermon tonight, He's Still Working on Me. He's Still Working on Me. I wonder how many of us tonight will honestly admit that we are a work in progress. I'm, I'm not all that I ought to be. But I thank God I'm not what I used to be. He's still working on me. Paul greets these Philippian believers with a prayer of, of thanksgiving. He is thankful upon the slightest remembrance of them. These people who had proven to be a very special blessing to Paul in his ministry in the gospel. Paul takes the time to, to tell them how much he appreciates their friendship. He appreciates how they have ministered to him. They sent an offering to him. They have met his needs. And so he writes them a, a thank you note and sends it by his emissary, Epaphroditus, to tell them how much he appreciates having them in his life. Brothers and sisters, tonight it's important to let people know when they've been a blessing to you. You ought not wait. You ought not let a moment pass. You ought not let a day go by if there's somebody who has shown you a kindness, if there's somebody who has meant much in your spiritual maturation, if there's been somebody who's given you a helping hand, who's done something for you that they didn't have to do, somebody who has gone out of their way to be kind to you, you ought to say thank you to them while they can hear it. I remember when Hurricane Katrina struck some people from New Orleans came to live at my house. Uh, Reverend Freddie Dunn, who's going to be with the Lord, his, his wife, 
Sister Ruth Dunn and two of her daughters, and uh, Miss Precious Clark and two of her daughters, six women came to live in my home. And they stayed with me, and uh, Mrs. Dunn, when they were getting ready to leave, they stayed from September almost to the end of October. And when they were getting ready to leave, Mrs. Dunn called me in the den where she was and put both her hands on my shoulder, and she said, Terry, look at me in my eyes. She said, everything that I own in this world is 10 feet underwater. My mink coats, my, my purses, my shoes, my clothes, Everything I have is 10 feet underwater. She said, we called and asked, could we come over here and stay with you until we could get back to New Orleans? And without hesitation, you let us come to live in your home. She said, everything I have is gone. She said, you and your sister Gwen, we didn't have clothes to wear. We didn't have food. We couldn't even get money out of the bank because all of the banks in New Orleans were closed and all of our records were underwater. You fed us and you brought, bought clothes for us. She said, I'm probably going to get to heaven before you. She said, I'm going to see my husband. I'm going to see your mother and father. But more than that, I'm going to see Jesus. And I'm going to tell him how you treated me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was outdoors and you took me in. I was hungry and you fed me. And it wasn't many days after that, after she left, that Sister Dunn went to be with the Lord. But she expressed to me how much she appreciated what I had done for her. And when I go home to Louisiana, where I'm from, I, I visit mostly graves now because just about all my people are gone. But I walk around those graves in the cemetery and verbally say thank you to those old people who meant much in my growing up years. Because I can scarcely think of where or who I would be right now if somebody had not gone out of their way to be kind to me. Paul takes the time to write this letter to them. He says, every time I think about it, every time you run across my mind, every time I remember you, I give you thanks. I give God thanks for you, for, for your labor, for how you work with me in the gospel ministry. And then Paul encourages them in verse number six, he says, I am confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will perfect it, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I want you to look with me, brothers and sisters. Walk with me around the text. And I want you to look with me, first of all, at the confidence that belongs to the saints. The confidence that belongs to the saints. Paul uses a strong word to describe the hope that he has in Jesus Christ. The verb confident is in the perfect tense and it actually refers to a settled persuasion of mind that was the continuing result, a result of a crisis in the past that God has made future and given you hope in the present. Paul is saying to these believers, he's exalting the fact that the saints can have an absolute assurance that they are saved without a doubt. He wishes to emphasize, brothers and sisters, that his certainty is grounded on God's creative and God's sustaining activity. The Bible literally overflows with verses that tell the believer that we can know for sure that we are saved. Tonight, I'm confident. I'm not diffident. I'm not equivocating. I'm not nervous. I'm not unsure. I am confident that he who has begun a good work will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I'm not guessing about my salvation. I know that if I don't wake up in the morning, when I open my eyes, I'm going to see Jesus Christ. I know that there is a poem waiting for me on the other side. I know that. I'm confident. I am assured and I don't have any doubt that I'm saved. 
And I need to say to somebody in here tonight, people ought to guess how old you are. People ought to guess how much you weigh. But they ought not have to guess if you've been born again. You ought to be confident. You're not looking at nobody. You don't care what anybody says after church is over. If God has been good to you, if God has opened a door for you, if God has made a way for you, if God has written your name in the Lamb's book of life, whatever it takes to express how glad you are that you know that you're saved, I don't care who you're sitting by, I don't care what they think, if God has saved you, be confident that he who has begun a good work will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. If you've traveled on our side of town, um, on 288 right around Blodgett and Southmore, if you're using your cell phone, if you're on 288 at Blodgett and Southmore, uh, there's a dead spot in that area. And uh, if you're talking on the phone or uh, got your Bluetooth in, your, your call will drop uh, because there's a dead spot right there on 288 at, at Blodgett and Southmore. Uh, tonight, in the church without walls, uh, it may be a dead spot where you're sitting. You're saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, and somebody next to you might say, it don't take all of that. You, you don't have to do all of that. You don't have to make all that noise. The man ain't said nothing yet, and you hollering and screaming. He haven't gotten to the end yet, and you making all that noise. You might be in a dead spot right in this church tonight but you have my permission in the middle of this message to get up from where you seated get away from them dead people and find somebody who is confident sure without a doubt that he who has begun a good work will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ the Bible is running over with verses to give us confidence. First John chapter 5 and verse 1 says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. First John 5 and 13 says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that you have eternal life. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passing away, and behold, all things are become new. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. I will let nothing separate me from the love of God. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose. I am confident that he who has begun a good work will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, it is not my grip on God, but it is God's grip on me that makes the difference in my salvation. I am not confident in my goodness. I am not confident in my character. I am not confident in my history. I am not confident in my ability to persevere. But I am confident in God. Uh, one of my favorite hymns is Blessed Assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste 
of glory divine. I'm an heir of salvation. I'm purchased by God, born of his spirit and washed in his blood. Perfect submission. All is at rest. I in my savior am happy and blessed. I'm watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story. This is my song. I'm praising my Savior all the day long. I am confident that he who has begun a good work will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I'm not nervous about it. I'm not iffy about it. I don't always look saved. I don't always act saved. I don't always sound saved. I don't always feel saved. But thank God, my salvation is not based on how I sound, how I feel, how I look. My salvation is based on the fact that Christ died to set me free. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get through with this so I can go fellowship with, with, with my young friend Ralph. Um, but let me make you blush here at the church without walls like they blush at Lily Grove. Every sin I ever committed, I enjoy. Come on, help me, brother. Because it doesn't make sense to sin if you're not going to enjoy it. I started preaching at 18, pastoring at 20. I never had a young adult life, so I had to do all my sinning in church. Somebody ought to help me preach here. I had to do all my sinning in church. I've never been to clubs. I've never smoked dope. I've never been drunk. I've never liked to be out of control of my environment. And so I've always been in control of myself, so I never got a chance to do a whole lot of young adult things, and I envy that. I wish I would have had an opportunity to do that, but, but I've, I've been a preacher just about all of my life. Longer than I haven't been, I've been a preacher. I've been a pastor longer than I haven't been, and every sin I committed in church, I enjoy. Now, just like I enjoyed myself in my sin. I enjoy myself in my salvation. And I am not about to let you or anybody else dictate to me how I ought to thank God for my salvation. I wish I had one or two more believers here. If you don't like the noise I'm making, go sit somewhere else. If me waving my hand is getting on your nerves, find you a dead spot to sit in. But I've come here tonight on purpose to tell God, thank you for saving me. Thank you for setting me free. Thank you for writing my name in the Lamb's book of life. Thank you for going to the cross, dying in my, he took my place. And I came here tonight on purpose to give God my best hallelujah. My best thank you, Jesus. My best praise the Lord. I am confident. That he who has begun a good work will complete it, will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's the confidence of the saints. But the confidence of the saints, brothers and sisters, is based on the commitment of the Savior. It's right here in the text. I'm confident of this very thing, that he, Jesus, who has begun a good work in me. We all know what God did for us the day he saved us. But what we fail 
what we fail brothers and sisters to consider is the fact that our salvation began long before we realized it. As much as I shout over the fact of Christ going to the cross and dying in my place at a spatio-temporal time and relationship in the universe, as much as I celebrate what he did on the cross, I celebrate even more that he did it before I even knew it. He saved me before I knew I needed to be saved. Let me see if I can help us with that. Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 3 says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. He chose us in Christ and prepared a savior for us before the world was even framed. Listen, the very faith we needed to trust in him, he provided. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace, come on, help me quote it here, are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Our good works have not resulted in salvation, but rather our good works come from salvation. You cannot work your way to heaven. You, you can never be good enough because when will you know when you're good enough? You can't sing enough. You can't pray enough. You can't preach enough. Salvation is all grace. It's the gift of God, lest any man should boast. Uh, our good works don't, 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 don't save us, but we work because we have been saved. Uh, brothers and sisters, the same God who began this good work is able to perform it. Uh, he will bring it to an end. This God of ours is able to complete it. He's able to accomplish it. And if we trust him, he will keep us until the day of redemption. He's faithful to his promises and he's faithful to his purposes. F.B. Meyer says, we are sure that the work which his grace has begun, the arm of his strength will complete. Let me run that by you one more time. F.B. Meyer says, we are sure that the work which his grace has begun, the arm of his strength will complete. The Holy Spirit never loses sight of the end of his work. His work will not end until he has made us just like Jesus. He will continue working on us until he has made us presentable enough to pass with praise through the final test of judgment and fit to walk into the presence of God and stand by Jesus whom God sent to save us so that when we walk with Jesus in heaven, the angels won't be able to tell the difference. Uh, brothers and sisters, Jude says it like this. Now unto him, who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding great joy. You're here tonight not because you've been dieting and exercising. You're here tonight not because you've been going to the doctor and following your prescription. You're here tonight not because you read the Bible and you've kept the Lord's commandments so closely. Jesus Christ, through his Holy Spirit, is just able to keep us and to present us faultless even in our sinful flesh. Now let me help somebody tonight. My born-again soul will never die, nor ever sin. 
but I sin in my flesh every day. Talk back to me if you can. Uh, to, you, to you here who are so holy that, that you answer your phone, praise the Lord. And, and you too blessed to be stressed. And you blessed and highly favored. And, and come on, talk back to me if you can. You, you, you know some people like that. You, you hate to talk to them because they're so ultra spiritual that if they take their coat off or their dress, you can see their wings because they, they are so pure and so chaste. But there are some of us in here, about three or four hundred of us in here, who don't mind testifying that some days I get up on the wrong side of the bed. Sometimes I'm just full of hell. I don't want to talk. I don't want to speak. I don't want to do right. I know what right is. I don't want to do what the Bible says. I don't want to live right. But then the Holy Spirit constrains us and brings us back to our senses because in our flesh we sin, but thank God His Spirit keeps us that when we get to church, He revives our soul again. I, I can't testify for you. I can only be a witness for myself that I need the Lord every day. I need him to keep my mind, to keep my heart. I wish I had two or three witnesses here. I, I, I want the Lord to keep on working on me. And I want you Christians here to be patient with me. Uh, God ain't through with me yet. Uh, be patient. Listen, whenever you see a person fall, don't judge him because you don't know how long he tried to stand. And maybe had you been walking in his shoes, you might have fallen a long time before. Somebody going to help me preach it. Uh, every time you point the finger at somebody, the scripture says, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye who are spiritual, restore him in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you be overtaken in the same fault. My salvation ain't based on what I do. It's based on what's already been done for me. Christ did it for me. Christ died for me. And his commitment to me keeps me saved. That's the confidence that the saint has. Based on the commitment of the Savior. Finally broadened by the comfort given to us in the scriptures. Our brothers and sisters hear me. There is comfort in knowing that this earthly life will not last forever. There is coming a day when the saints of God will leave this world with all of its pitfalls, all of its hardships, all of its sorrows. All of this will be over after a while. You here who are over 50, can help me and Ralph to testify. Uh, I remember when our hair was black, when we were slender and good looking, b before y'all wore all the pretty off of us, when we were young and, and vibrant, full of life and energy. But now, Ralph and I, and many of you in here tonight, are over 50, and you can help me testify. That um, when you get over 50, when you wake up in the morning, you sound like a bowl of Rice Krispies. <laughs> Snap, crackle, and pop. If it ain't your shoulder, it's your knee. If it's not your knee, it's your elbow. Somebody ought to help me talk it. You get out of the bed and stand up on your feet and your feet hurting and you ain't walked on them all night. I need somebody over 50 to help me shout here. 
you're looking for your car keys and they're in your hand. You're looking for your eyeglasses and you got them on. You go in the room and say, what in the blank did I just go in here for? Somebody ought to help me talk here. Um, because uh, there's a leak in this building. Somebody going to help me close here in a minute. And sooner or later, my soul has got to move. I wish I had one or two witnesses here. Uh, I get tired of ugly words from people at the church. Uh, come on, talk back to me. Some of the most hurtful things that have ever been said about you and I have been said by people who go to church. Some of the meanest people in Houston belong to the church without walls. Some of the nastiest people in Texas sing in the choir at Lily Grove. Some of the ugliest acting people in the world go to church every Sunday morning. If there was such a thing as a bus loading up to go to hell, it could pick up its first load at the church. I get tired of folk lying on me. I get tired of folk criticizing me. I'm doing the best I can and they don't appreciate it. Somebody ought to help me talk here. I'm giving God my best sermon and they say he could have done better than that. You sing your best song and they say that was too loud. You could have toned it down. You come to church and just try to give God glory. You've had hell all the week long. Hell in your family. Mess on your job a no good supervisor, a silly child, a crazy husband or wife. Don't you get tired of that? Sickness, stress, heart attacks, struggle, strain. Don't you get sick of that? Medicine, IVs, shots, doctor's appointments, funeral homes, graveyards. I'm getting tired of that. Young man, pastor talked about a moment ago, shot by some fool here in Houston for no good reason. I saw on the news this morning, two young babies burned, one of them was burned, left in the house by a mother and a father. Another child was beaten to death, two years old. I'm tired of that. I'm sick of women being raped and, and young children being sexually assaulted. I'm sick of blacks being beaten up and shot by the policemen. I'm tired of white folks walking all over us and Negroes walking all over us. Somebody ought to help me talk here. Because sometimes the problem ain't coming from the outside. The problem is in our own house. I'm tired of that. I'm sick of the world and the mess that it's become. But one of these days, I am confident that he who has begun a good work in me will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I'm going to my seat now. But that day of Jesus Christ is not talking about judgment because my judgment was handled at Calvary. I need somebody to help me close right here. When I stand before God, brothers and sisters, I'm going to be confident, not in my history, not in my goodness, but confident that what Jesus did once and for all will take me before the Father without a spot or a blemish. I need somebody to help me close right here. I know that one day when I stand before God, it won't be because of the sins that I committed. Because he nailed my sins to the cross. The handwritten ordinances, Colossians says, that were against me, he nailed them to the cross. And the hammer he used doesn't have a claw on the end of it so that you can take those sins off the cross. Because he will never judge me again for sin because that would be double jeopardy. In the court of law, you can't be tried twice for the same crime. That's double jeopardy. When I stand before God, it's not going to be about my sins. 
because Jesus paid for my sins on the cross. But when I stand before God, it's going to be to get my reward because I've borne my burden in the heat of the day. I've worked in the church all of my life. I've given God my best service. I've tried to live a Christian life. I've tried to be a godly preacher and pastor. I've made some mistakes. I've done some things right and I've done some things wrong. But I still thank God that he called me. I still thank God that he saved me. I still thank God that every Sunday he's pleased to use me. I'm not all that I ought to be. And I'm not yet what I'm going to be. But I thank God I'm not what I used to be. Some of you who was raised in the church, I need somebody who was raised in the church who remember when those old deacons would get on their knees and we would go home and pray just like we heard them pray. Because they would pray the same prayer every morning. I wish I had somebody who was raised in the church who can help me close right here. They say, now Lord, here I am. Knee bent and body bowed with my face bowed to the mother's dust and my heart lifted to the throne of grace. Thank you that the bed I laid in was not my cooling bowl. I wish I had somebody raised in the church. And the kivers that I laid in was not my winding sheet. Thank you for a reasonable portion of my health and strength. Thank you that when I woke up this morning, you touched me with a finger of love and my eyes sprang wide open and I beheld a brand new day, a day that I'd never seen before and a day that I'll never see again. And we used to laugh at those prayers and we used to go home and mock them for those prayers. But now that some of us are over 50, we get down on our knees and say, now Lord, I want to thank you that the bed I laid in was not my cooling bowl. I want to thank you for a reasonable portion of my health and strength. Is there anybody here? No trouble don't last always. It's a mess in this world right now, but I'm going home to be with the Lord. There's trouble all over Houston right now, but there's a bright side somewhere. There's strife in your family. There's hurt in your relationships. But after a while, it's all going to be over. The scripture gives us the assurance that we know that when this earthly house of this tabernacle is dissolved, we have another building. A house not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. You're going to help me close this, won't you? Let not your hearts be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come again and receive you under myself. You're going to help me close this, won't you? Soon I will be done with the troubles of this world. I'm going home to live with God. Is there anybody here confident tonight that he who began a good work will complete it? until the day of Jesus Christ. Is there anybody here know that your name is in the Lamb's book of life? If the Lord's been good to you and you don't mind testifying, if God has opened the door for you and you don't care who's looking at you, if God has made a way for you and you're not embarrassed to testify, why don't you grab somebody? Why don't you shake somebody's hand? Tell them, I know, I know in whom I believe. And he's able to keep that. Come on, tell somebody else. He's able to keep that 
which I have committed unto him. You're going to help me talk about him, won't you? I haven't called his name too much. But let me call his name before I take my seat right now. I haven't said his name too much. But I feel like calling his name right now. Y'all going to help me call his name. I feel like calling his name. He's Adam's redeemer. He's Abel's vindicator. He's Abraham's sacrifice. He's Noah's ark. He's Moses' bush on fire. Y'all know him, don't you? He's Joshua's battle axe. He's Gideon's fleece. He's Samson's power. He's David's music. He's Solomon's wisdom. Y'all know him, don't you? He's God's only son. He's Mary's baby boy. He's James and Jude's older brother. He's Matthew's king. Mark's suffering servant. Luke's great physician. John's word made flesh. Acts coming of the Holy Ghost. The only begotten of the Father. Y'all know him, don't you? He's a rock in a weary land. He's a shelter in a time of storm. He's a friend when you're friendly. Bread when you're hungry. Water when you're thirsty. Why don't you grab somebody? Why don't you hug your neighbor? Tell him I know him for myself. I know him. I know him. I know him. without walls I gotta tell you my testimony one more time the doctor said I'd be dead in two hours that was three years ago and he said if I live I'd have to go in a nursing home but here I am tonight clothed and in my right mind with a reasonable portion of my health and strength and if you don't mind Help me tell God thank you. Come on, tell him thank you. Like thank you for all you've done for me. Thank you for the many ways you've made. Thank you for the many doors you've opened. Thank you. 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 